I'm Nimo Basi from Nigeria. Why don't you talk about how you first came to understand synthetic biotechnology and, and what the potential dangers are to synthetic biotechnology? For slightly more than a decade now, the issue of genetic engineering has become very central to many of us who are working on food and hunger issues in Africa. And this is because the biotech industry has presented genetic engineering as a solution to hunger and a solution to the climate within the continent. And whereas the traditional and the most reliable agricultural systems do not permit monoculture, which biotechnology promotes, the industry has been working very hard behind the scenes to compel governments to create very weak biosafety laws so as to introduce genetically engineered crops into Africa and other places of the world that are not contaminated. And we were very, have been very concerned that the industry is just looking for profit and for control because if they control the food systems of any country, they more or less colonize the country. Uh, so we, we've looked at the promises of the industry. They promise to produce food that is more nutritious. They promise to produce crops that produce more harvest. They promise to produce crops that use less herbicides and pesticides. And they've not delivered on any of these promises. The, yeah, so, so we've been examining these this kind of things and this uh, has been a very big concern to us. And by extension, the new area of synthetic biology is just building up on all these false premises and it's going to create much more problems than we could expect from biotech. And the IMF and the World Bank uh, have a big role in the economies, particularly underdeveloped countries. Why don't you talk about how governments have been pressurized to accept these biotech companies and energy companies for the development of these products? Well, the issue of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund uh, to me raises a lot of alarms because in the 1980s, these same Bretton Woods institutes introduced what they call the structural adjustment programs. And these were programs that were meant to open up economies of less powerful nations to, for the powerful countries to dump products into them and for corporation, transnational corporations to reap huge profits to disempower local production and also destroy local agriculture. And this has been very successful because they destroyed the poultry industry in many countries in Africa. They destroyed the rice, rice production capacities of many countries. And all these add up to uh, destroy the general economy of the region and also, also manufacture, I would say, hunger and poverty. And this is still, it's increasingly clear that the same arm-twisting tactics of these institutions are being used now to lower regulation for introduction of biotechnology, modern biotechnology products and genetically engineered crops. Would you imagine, for example, that in Nigeria, they're talking about genetically engineering cassava uh, to have heightened levels of vitamin A. Vitamin A is a thing you can get from carrots, from, from other fruits. You don't need to genetically engineer cassava to get carrot to get vitamin A. So it's all a system that's targeting the staple food crops uh, so as to con totally control what people do, what people produce, and what they eat. Uh, so it's all a interest of corporations, not the interest of the farmers or the people. And maybe you can talk about Pfizer which has been experimenting in Nigeria and how they pressurized the government. There were uh, transcripts, email transcripts about what happened uh, in Nigeria between Pfizer the, and the U.S. government when they did these activities there. Yeah, the, the interesting things about the information that has been coming out, from, especially from Wikileaks and the, and, and the like, is that it's been put very clear to everyone that corporations have captured governments around the world, from the strongest, most powerful government is captured by corporations, they're directed by corporations. So we no longer have democracy as the government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's now government of the corporations, for corporations, and by corporations. And this is, this is a twisted way to, to look at governance. But this is what is happening to international global structures of negotiations and multilateral agreements between countries. 
And so Pfizer, it's not surprising that Pfizer had such uh, strong backings from the government of the United States and also that they could, they could um, cause such havoc in Nigeria, killing children and harming so many of them by using experimental dr drugs that had not yet been uh, certified for use on children or use anywhere at all. Uh, and then they wouldn't even allow investigations to be carried out. And when a suit was filed against them, they began to blackmail the Attorney General of Nigeria uh, to soft pedal on the amount of damage that the Pfizer was uh, to pay. So that at the end of the day, they only agreed to pay a pittance that doesn't, doesn't begin to address the, the harm done to the family, to children, to families, and to the psyche of the entire population. A drug that had not been approved, they were just testing clinical trials without warning the parents, without warning the, without even warning the government. And it came as a surprise that, that children just began to die and there were so many defects, you know. So this has been released by WikiLeaks, but it, the whole issue of, of these corporate control of governments, that basically the government can't even be responsible for the people. I mean, is this, and this whole genetic engineering and, and synthetic uh, uh, biotechnology, the, the danger that that has to the people of Nigeria, the people of the world. This, this is the biggest danger with synthetic biology because um, uh, I, the, to a lesser extent, genetic, genetically engineered crops, when I said to a lesser extent, genetically engineered crops could be more or less controlled to some extent, although they are very dangerous and we don't want them. Now, with synthetic biology, the scientists are creating, trying to create new life forms that don't, some of them may not have equivalence in nature. Uh, and so you, you're talking about the whole scale destruction of ecosystems. And if you have these corporations retaining their power over political structures, then we're, we're looking at massive uh, ecocide on our hands. There's a threat to the planet and profit for a few pockets, and this cannot be allowed to go on. And, you know, there's always this constant thing about Africa, the poverty of Africa, the starvation in Africa. Uh, what you're saying is that this has been engineered? Is this, is this what you're saying? You know, Africa over the years has been used as a poster, poster child for poverty and for hunger. But people should be asking the question, when did Africa become hungry? It doesn't go much further back than the introduction of structural adjustment programs by the World Bank and the IMF. Africa was largely self-sufficient and in fact was always been a, a, an exporter of we're exporting net surplus products to Europe and elsewhere. But the control of the, by corporations and the governments of the rich countries has focused on destroying the economic, uh, economic uh, fabric of Africa so as to impoverish the continent and, and control everything else for resource exploitation. Uh, I wrote a book recently about the destructive extraction of the continent and climate crisis to cook a continent. So generally what is going on is a cooking of the African continent to keep the people under control and to occasionally throw in a few dimes as philanthropy. But, so you, you see the, uh, uh, the the introduction of the, of the structural adjustment programs, opening up of the markets to dump surplus, surplus products, destruction of local economies, local farming, destruction of safety nets and support for farmers. All this has gone on to, to make the continent appear what it is. And of course, the more the myth of the intractable problems in Africa, Africa being the last continent or being the sort of basket case of the world, the more this image is entrenched, then the more the continent is controlled for extraction of resources, for land grabbing, for convert, conversion of farmlands into crops for machines instead of for people. Nobody's asking, the, this question should be asked. How come if there's so much, if the world is concerned with helping Africa overcome food deficit. How come the same powerful countries are uh, using up the arable agricultural lands of the continent to produce crops that are not edible or for crops that are just being exported to Europe or North America for production of biofuels or what we, prop what we properly call agrofuels? So we're seeing a structural problem here of manipulation for control. Now, Nigeria is one of the largest producers of oil in the world, and they say they want to become an advanced economy in the world. But it seems like 
the systemic corruption that, that exists prevents even the people of Nigeria from getting the resources that come from the export of oil. What, what are the systemic problems in Nigeria? Well, the, the systemic problem of Nigeria is uh, um, symptomatic of the systemic problem of the world, where competition, accumulation, and disposition is a creed. It's what people are, people are not looking for, They're looking at our ways of living in solidarity, living in, in harmony with nature, and believing the African para the, Af the African African philosophy of Ubuntu that my, my humanity is connected to your own humanity. So we're seeing a situation where there's a corrupt system of thinking and corrupt system of acting. But when it comes to corruption in Nigeria, corruption in Nigeria became a major issue from the mid 1970s and became heightened in the 1980s. Uh, in the in the early in the early post colonial year of the early 1960s. Political leaders were fairly um, morally upright, ethically upright, and there wasn't much corruption. But when the, as soon as crude oil became a major income earner, then we transited into a voodoo kind of economy where production is minimized, but capital accumulation becomes the in thing. Because uh, now we were an agricultural nation. All the regions of Nigeria were very self-sufficient and making a lot of money from agriculture. But once oil became the major income earner, then everything else got abandoned. So there's a corruption of the political system, of the social system, of the economic system, and even of the spiritual atmosphere. So we, right now, what we have, I would say the most corrupt system is a resource corruption, as well as corruption that is not internal to Nigeria, corruption that is externally driven. Nigeria produces about 2 million barrels of crude oil every day right now. And we believe that about half of that, I mean, an another 1 million barrels is produced and stolen from the country. And this is not stolen in buckets or in drones by local people. It's stolen and sold on the international market, which means that there's an international racket going on, aiding corruption, uh, working with local elites and the security system. To, to, to rape the, the country of its resources. Now, I would prefer that oil should be left in the soil. In fact, we're arguing that Nigeria should not open up any new oil field. What Nigeria needs to do is to stop oil theft so that we know what comes out of the ground and what gets exported. The two should be more or less the same. Right now, Nigeria does not know how much oil is extracted because the corporations have refused to say, even though it's demanded by law, they refuse to state how much oil they pump out of the wells. The, the record that we have is how much oil is gets to the term, distribution terminals. And so there's a lot going on apart from the pollution and the, the pollution from oil spills, which is very regular. There's at least one oil spill every day, more or less. And recently we had a big offshore oil spill on 20 December 2011 from a Shell offshore platform and up to, they admitted 40,000 barrels of oil was spilled. And to them, that was a small amount of oil. And then we had a Chevron gas rig catching fire January 2012. And that fire went on for up to one month before they started drilling a relief rig. And then the fire, fire suddenly stopped and they don't know how the fire stopped. The explanation Chevron gave is that maybe some rocks fell into the gas well and blocked the, the well and they stopped the, 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 the fire. But then, Fishermen tell us that they still see gas bubbling all around the area. So the pollution is continuing, but because of the prevalence of the power of the, this industry over political structures in Nigeria, and because they're the major income earner for the government, and they are at the same time destroying the fabric of society, communities living in the oil fields. Now, are you shocked or surprised that you come to the United States, you come to the Bay Area where Chevron is headquartered, and here Chevron is talking about green energy and developing synthetic biotechnology to, to make things more efficient. When you, you in Nigeria, the people of Nigeria see waste, they see explosions, they see uh, the contamination of the whole country by Chevron and other big oil companies. It's, it's absolutely shocking that, I mean, we, we, I, I just see very clearly the issue of double standards. These corporations like Chevron, 
BP and the rest don't keep to international, international accepted standards. And in Nigeria, they don't even keep to their own in-house standards. And they don't keep to the standards required by the government. And it, it, is, it is a situation that, you know, in Nigeria where even the workers are not protected. All, I try to discuss with all sector workers. And many of them are not, they're not aware of the health impact of the, of the stuff that they work with, of, the, of, of handling certain chemicals and things that they're exposed to on a daily basis. So when the corporations speak about health and safety education, they're talking about things that are very mundane and that any other factory would do, but they're pe peculiar things to the oil sector. And we, we find uh, workers handling very toxic things and in an unex a very exposed manner. And then some of them are, when they complain of the problems or maybe a part of the things, incentive given to them. For example, I, I was in a meeting with the uni was some unionists in the oil sector. And those who work with power plants told me that, well, they're, they're well taken up that they, uh, because they're exposed to so much pollution from the fumes, they're given milk, that they drink a lot of milk and this cleanses the system. So, you know, it, selling the milk falsehood to milk the willing cow. So they're basically bribed. The workers are given extra money or milk and told, don't worry about it, you're, you're being compensated. Yeah, it's, it's both bribery and deception. And the, the issue of cancer, the issue of the chemicals in the environment, I mean, it's just... Yes, you know, I, I, I get really very disturbed because the, the picture of the oil fields of Nigeria is a picture of hell. We have... Um, most the oil coming out of the ground in the, in Nigeria is a, has a lot of associated natural gas, and rather than this gas being utilized for industrial purposes, or for, either for power generation or for or for as liquefied natural gas for cooking, uh, the oil companies simply set the gas on fire. So we have close to three hundred gas flare stacks in the delta burning day and night for decades, non-stop. $2.5 billion worth of gas going up in smoke every year. And they're releasing terribly noxious gases to the atmosphere, causing cancers, blood disorders, skin diseases, bronchitis, asthma, and also acid rain. And the poor people in the communities use corrugated iron sheets for their roofs. And so when you have acid rain, these roofs get corroded so quickly, they, they're forced to replace them. And these are poor people who don't have money to build in the first place. And then, of course, most of the, in a place like Ogoni land, all the United Nations Environmental Program did a study recently, paid for by Shell, who polluted Ogoni land. They paid $9.5 million for that study. And the study revealed that all the water bodies in Ogoni land, which is a part of the Niger Delta of Nigeria, is polluted with hydrocarbons. In fact, in one, some communities, they have benzene in the drinking water 900 times above World Health Organization standards. And they have hydrocarbons polluting the soil up to close to 20 feet deep. And they've also said that it will require 30 years of consistent work to clean the waters in that territory. And then five years to clean the land. That, that is more or less a lifetime. Do you think that you can have the rational development of energy and, and society with private ownership of the energy industry? Uh, I think that... Uh, that would be very difficult to, to achieve right now because the corporations have got, gotten too strong. And they, they want to hang on to the fossil fuel paradigm until they get the last drop of oil from the, from the ground. They don't care about the environment. They don't care about the people in the oil fields. And in fact, this is why gasoline is still, is still, fairly, uh, is still affordable by people. If the environmental cost were to be added, it would be, it would be much more expensive. That it wouldn't be a viable energy source at all. But nobody sees where these things being extracted. They don't see the workers, they don't see the common people, the community people dying from all the diseases and the pollution. And so this keeps on going unchecked. Um, I think the future would be uh, small, small scale energy production, you know, solar power, for example, uh, not sold on national grids, but maybe community based or regional basis. Uh, things that can easily, small hydros that can be controlled by communities or by regions and not the ones that are so prone to control by big corporations and, and governments. 
Now, the unions in Nigeria, there have been general strikes. There have been mass movements of people where the entire society has... Why don't you talk about those... Yes, we, we had a flashpoint in January 2012 when the government suddenly woke up overnight and doubled gasoline prices. And Nigerian people rose up as one to reject that kind of uh, economic move, which we believe was driven by the, again, by the International Monetary Fund and maybe the World Bank. How did they do that? Well, because they control, they, they more or less have to endorse policies of government before they are enacted or before they are they announced. So, and if I recently, the Nigerian president said he was setting up a, a desk, a desk in the presidency for the World Bank to control, to help advise on contracts. So it's a very big. Now, what happened in January this year, 2012, was very instructive and symbolic, because for the first time, there was a very strong correlation, working cooperation between labor and civil society and ordinary Nigerians. And although the strike was called off after a week, uh, there's a process of continual engagement and political education going on now, and we're all very involved in it. So the strike next time will be a very stiff and steep one. So how do people collaborate and cooperate? Um, well, you see, the, the issues that we're confronted with are issues of life and survival. And we, we need organized labor to show leadership. And so people come, come behind organized labor because they have labor, labor, the workers all over the country. United workers cannot easily be divided or defeated. And in civil society, with social media and with all the disenchantment going on, it's so very easy to mobilize and to organize. So this is what, what we see coming together. So that was an historic first. Very historic moment. And this is why we want to sustain. A, or there's still a lot of organizing going on, a lot of cooperation going on, a lot of education going on. And we believe the government is paying attention.